So bladder cancers come in many different shapes and sizes. The way that we typically think about bladder cancer is being non-muscle invasive or muscle invasive. And what that actually means is if you think about a bladder tumor like a piece of broccoli growing into the bladder, we actually don't uh, care too much about the size of that flower. And similarly, the stem doesn't have much meaning. All we care about are the root system from that broccoli. Are the roots going deep into the bladder wall, into the muscle of the bladder, or are they more superficial, just invading either the first lining of the bladder or not invading at all? And that's really what matters in terms of what kinds of recommendations we'll make to patients and their family members about the best options in treating their bladder cancer. The traditional thinking is that bladder cancer is a disease of aging. And when you look across 100 patients, that's very true. The average age of a patient with bladder cancer is typically in their early 70s. But one of the things that I think is underappreciated is that younger people do get bladder cancer. And uh, similarly, while two-thirds of bladder cancers may be among men, women also make up a, a significant proportion of patients with bladder cancer. Uh, many people are under the impression that all bladder cancers uh, is due to smoking. And actually, that's not the case. Uh, around 40% of bladder cancer is attributable to smoking, but that means that the vast majority of bladder cancers, more than 60%, are completely unrelated. For that other 60%, a small proportion, it may be due to other environmental exposures, uh, workplace exposures, for example, uh, people that worked in factories, specifically with dyes uh, and other chemicals. Um, but for uh, the majority of, of these patients, we don't yet quite understand uh, why they developed bladder cancer. And that's a question we get quite often. Why, why me? Why have I gotten that, uh, that diagnosis? And uh, the truth is, is that the majority of the time, the honest answer is we don't know yet. Now, this is something that we're looking at very closely. And one of the reasons why we're very interested in, for example, doing genomic sequencing of the vast majority of patients that walk through our doors with bladder cancer is to understand what are the commonalities among these patients and, and what can we learn in terms of uh, uh, genuine both environmental and maybe familial risk factors. You know, it's very interesting. There's, there's probably around a single digit percent of bladder cancers that are, can be attributable to some type of family history. There are some, some cancer syndromes that can be associated with bladder cancer, but the vast majority of bladder cancers are not related to a family history. And probably what's going on is what we think of as a two-hit hypothesis, which is somebody has some risk factor uh, that they're born with for developing a bladder cancer, and then there is a second hit of some environmental exposure that may be subtle that may combine to then give them that cancer. So it's probably uh, multifactorial. There's probably more than one reason why they're developing that cancer, but most likely uh, less than 5% or so is actually due to a family history. Typically, a patient is diagnosed with bladder cancer either by having blood in their urine, a term we call hematuria, or by finding a mass on their bladder through some other diagnostic means. For example, a CT scan or an ultrasound might pick up a mass. And then from there, a urologist will directly visualize uh, the tumor in their bladder. That's called a cystoscopy. And then they will typically take them to the operating room and under anesthesia, remove the mass. That is both diagnostic and therapeutic. The prognosis for a bladder cancer patient depends very closely on what stage they are. So how deep does the bladder tumor invade into the muscle? Um, 
what is the uh, status of the lymph nodes in the body? Does it look like there's cancer in those lymph nodes? And is there evidence of cancer in other parts of the body? Um, and, and taken together, those three things, the tumor uh, location and depth, the T, the nodes involved, the N, and whether there's other sites of disease, that's the M, is called the TNM staging. And that really allows us to uh, understand and determine the prognosis. So we are truly at a crossroads uh, in bladder cancer care today. One of the reasons for that is there have been multiple new therapies that have been FDA approved for advanced and metastatic bladder cancer. Similarly, we have started to see new drug approvals for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And that's really exciting because, for example, five or 10 years ago, I really only had one or two therapies to offer my patients uh, newly diagnosed with bladder cancer. But today, I'm able to offer them a multitude of different therapies and also uh, able to offer them innumerable, uh, innumerable clinical trials that we have available that may be the next latest and greatest thing tomorrow. So one of the things uh, that we try to do at Johns Hopkins is uh, assess what the patient's goals of care are and what the patients and their family members want. So for example, muscle invasive bladder cancer can be treated with removal of the bladder, typically with chemotherapy beforehand, but there are alternative options that, that can be uh, equally beneficial in certain cases. One of those is called trimodality therapy, which is combination of radiation and chemotherapy with close uh, surveillance of their bladder by a urologist. So the concept of genomic sequencing is that we can take a patient's tumor and identify all of the abnormalities that have caused that patient's cancer. So the genes that should be normal uh, and have somehow been subverted in that patient's bladder cancer, we can actually identify which genes uh, are mutated or made abnormal. And why is that important? It's important for multiple reasons. First of all, it allows us to understand uh, the origins of, of their cancer. But more importantly, now we actually have multiple therapies that have been uh, FDA approved that are based on specific gene mutations. And that alone is extremely uh, inspiring, exciting, all of these things, because it allows us to tailor certain therapies for patients' uh, specific uh, genomic subtype, and, and that's really exciting. There's a few reasons why I think that the bladder cancer care here at Johns Hopkins really is a center of excellence. Um, and one of those reasons stems on our multidisciplinary care. I work very closely with our medical oncologists and uh, radiation oncologists, oftentimes in the same uh, workspace, um, and am constantly discussing my patients with them. And so, for example, when a patient comes for a new visit, if we know in advance that they have, for example, muscle invasive bladder cancer, oftentimes they'll see both myself, a urologist, and a medical oncologist on that same day. So that's number one. Number two uh, is that I truly believe that we offer tomorrow's therapies today. And what I mean by that is we have at our, at our disposal clinical trials in really every disease space within bladder cancer. So whether you're diagnosed with the earliest stage disease or the latest stage, it doesn't matter. We are going to, to have uh, a therapy that may be standard of care, but we'll also have therapies uh, on trials that are very likely to be promising and be tomorrow's therapies. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, we are also actively involved in discovery. 
And so not only are we evaluating new therapies through clinical trials, but we're actually making those discoveries in the laboratory. And so we are oftentimes going to be the first ones to, uh, to offer new bladder cancer therapies and new bladder cancer diagnostics to our patients because we're the ones developing them. Thank you.